Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Will. I'm one of the pastors here at Greenpoint, and um, yeah, time now to come and look at God's Word together as we get into um, part two of the Amos series. So, if you've got your Bible there, I encourage you to open it up. Um, and if you missed last week, if you missed week one, you can always catch up our messages on YouTube. Um, there's like a, yeah, I think the QR code in the bulletin will get you there as well. Yep, so you can always find it that way. Um, if you've got 30 minutes spare in your week on a car ride or a train ride or even just working around the house, you can always listen to a message. Um, some of them are a little more than 30 minutes, but um, yeah. Last week in particular, as we did the intro to Amos, gives a little bit of information um, about who Amos is and where the book fits in context and... Uh, Amos also has a very unique intro, so yeah, you might like to catch that up if you missed it. But first of all, I actually wanted to start this morning with a bit of an opportunity for some discussion. Um, just a quick moment, just with the person or two next to you, only a, a quick question um, for you to discuss, which is, what does it mean to be a Christian and what does God want his uh, from his followers? Now, the idea here isn't that there's like a perfect answer and you have to get it or you've like sprung some trap and you're wrong. Um, there could be 150 different answers in this room and they could all be right in different ways. So please don't think this isn't a test. It's just an opportunity for some discussion for us to get thinking about these things. Okay, does that sound all right? So just for a minute or two, introduce yourself and have a quick chat about these two questions. <laughs> All right, I'll let you just finish up that thought with the person next to you. We, we don't always do discussion in the morning, but I feel like this is a good place, isn't it? We should be able to discuss these things. You sorted it, you figured it out, you got there, you taught him, you taught him the right answer. Find a friend. <laughs> Find a friend. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, not, a, not a trap question. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to some of that, but the point of today is not to tell you the correct answer on any of those things. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, good to think about questions like that sometimes. Um, so just as a bit of a recap um, to what we were talking about last week, we were talking about Amos and we talked about um, the idea that two of the main themes in the book of Amos are justice and mercy and that was something we talked about not just last week but we'll see throughout this series. Uh, so Amos... This is a hard section of scripture in a lot of ways. Um, potentially not a very popular section of scripture. I mean, it's all popular, but maybe one of the least spoken about. Um, it covers some very complex, very difficult themes and ideas, but also covered in these prophets are some really important ones and some that have really shaped Christianity and our understanding of God and the world that we live in. Um, so during this time uh, of the 8th century when Amos was written, this is before the fall of Israel, but a lot of what he's speaking about is the fall. So it's a warning, it's speaking of something which is yet to happen. And this time when Amos is writing and speaking um, to the nation of Israel, to the king of Israel, it's a time of peace and prosperity for that nation. On the surface, everything seemed to be going, going really well. People were doing really well, but beneath the splendor and shine on the outside was a festering wound of corruption and injustice. This is what we um, saw last week, just a snippet from last week, from chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. Speaking of the people of Israel, they sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. 
When you look at the writings um, of those books that we saw from the latter prophets, all of those different 15 um, prophets, there's a common expression that describes what God's message was through those prophets. Uh, the expression is that God is speaking to them to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. So for those people during those times who were victims of social inequality, those people who were downtrodden and oppressed and afflicted, God offers to those people through the latter prophets a message of hope and comfort and justice. But for those greedily profiting of the misfortune of others, and people uninterested in changing anything in their society because it works pretty well for me and my family, God offers a warning. And we saw last week that God's patience with his people had just about run out. His second and third and fourth chances that he'd offered them are expiring. And God is speaking to the people of Israel through the prophet Amos, delivering a final warning. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Listen to this message that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the entire family I rescued from Egypt. From among all the families on the earth, I have been intimate with you alone. That is why I must punish you for all your sins. The people of Israel thought that because they were God's holy chosen people, that they were exempt from the rules, from conditions of having to obey or be obedient, um, exempt from any possible punishment or anger from God. They thought that it's like working for a company where your dad is the boss. Uh, you can kind of get away with whatever you want, treat others how you want. You don't have to necessarily show up on time. You can do anything and you'll never get fired or disciplined because your dad's the boss. God says, actually, it's the opposite. Of all nations on the earth, they should have known better. But again, this message is coming to them in a time of prosperity and peace. And this Amos guy is just, he's not even a trained religious leader. He's just some shepherd from Tekoa who is coming here and telling us that God is speaking to him and through him, telling us that God's unhappy with us. Many of them would have been skeptical about listening to Amos, unsure uh, whether they need to actually listen to this warning or pay attention to it. Amos gives the people of Israel um, some questions. In fact, they're kind of almost riddles. There's a few different examples, and I want you to have a think about each one and see whether you can find the common theme throughout them, what it is that connects all of these different riddles or questions. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 to 7. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? Does it crawl in its den when it has caught nothing? Does a bird swoop down to a trap on the ground when there is no bait there? Does a trap spring up from the ground if it has not caught anything? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city... Has not the Lord caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. So I wonder in, in each of those examples whether you can pick a common thread or a connection between those different things, you know, things that people in those days would have seen in the world around them. It's all about cause and effect. Things don't just happen for no reason. Two people don't walk along chatting together as some random thing. It, it's because they both are wanting to do that. There's an intentionality behind it. Lions don't roar unless they've got something to say. A trap only springs when it's triggered by something. An animal's only drawn to a trap when there's bait placed in it. A lion only roars when it's ready to fight. God's judgment isn't some random event. Amos's warning isn't happening for no reason. And Amos doesn't want to be here, but God has sent him there 
because the actions of the people of Israel have brought it about. If someone sees a group of people about to walk into a loaded trap or about to walk into the path of a hungry lion, doesn't that person have a responsibility to warn them? And that's what Amos says, chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. The lion has roared, so who isn't frightened? The sovereign Lord has spoken, so who can refuse to proclaim his message? Announce this to the leaders of Philistia and to the great ones of Egypt. Take your seats now on the hills around Samaria and witness the chaos and oppression in Israel. For those who were here last week, um, we saw that uh, there are all these nations surrounding Israel, enemy nations, and the people of Israel were getting excited because they thought the judgment that was coming was going to be on them. They thought that that was what Amos was here to speak about. They thought that they were going to observe their enemies being punished, but instead here Amos gives this picture of summoning these rival enemy nations to sit... (laughs) almost in like a a stadium around the city of Samaria and to be witnesses to what is happening here in Israel. And maybe some of the people would have been listening to this thinking there are some bad people here in Israel and God's judgment must be on them. But not, not to me. I'll be spared. I'm not the one that God is angry with. I'm just, you know, I'm just doing the best for me and my family. I'm just a part of the system. I didn't create the system. Surely I will be spared. Surely me and, and the people that I care about will be spared. Amos does say that, yes, some people will be spared. Some people, this warning is not for them. But for anyone thinking, we're all just going to get through this, this probably doesn't apply to me, Amos dashes their hopes and assumptions, their desire to minimise hear what Amos is saying. This is what he says in verse 12. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd rescues from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites living in Samaria be rescued with only the head of a bed and a piece of fabric from a couch. So yes, there will be some who survive, some who this warning isn't for, Um, there will be a remnant, but it will be akin to a lamb getting eaten by a lion and a piece of an ear survives or is rescued. Or a couch which is completely destroyed, but a small piece of fabric survives. He's warning them not to downplay the seriousness of this warning. God can no longer ignore the pleas of the oppressed while he gives people endless chances to stop. He can't be like that dad at the workplace who just ignores everything that his child does. This judgment is not out of the blue. For centuries, God has been warning his people that how they are living is unacceptable. And there have been escalating warnings and punishments. We're not going to go through chapter 4 today, but if you want to at some point through the week. In chapter 4, you'll see some of the escalating things that God has been doing to try and turn his people around, to try and say to them, you need to change, but they've ignored every step. And eventually God can tolerate it no longer. He can't ignore the cries of the innocent anymore. And he says, it's time for justice. But Amos doesn't revel in it. He doesn't take any pleasure in the declaration of justice. In fact, he begs them. It's not too late for some of you to change. This is their final warning, but he truly wants them to listen. Chapter 5, verse 4. Now this is what the Lord says to the family of Israel. Come back to me and live. Don't worship at the pagan altars at Bethel. Don't go to the shrines at Gilgal or Beersheba. For the people of Gilgal will be dragged off into exile and the people of Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Come back to the Lord and live. Chapter 5 is a great chapter. I encourage you to read the whole thing again um, sometime through the week. And it's the clearest explanation. Maybe, Maybe we're wondering, you know, why is God so angry with them? This judgment thing is so horrible. 
Chapter 5 has the clearest explanation of what Israel's been doing to make God intervene. This is how he describes the situation in Israel. How you hate honest judges. How you despise people who tell the truth. You trample the poor, stealing their grain through taxes and unfair rent. Therefore, though you build beautiful stone houses, you will never live in them. Though you plant lush vineyards, you will never drink wine from them. For I know the vast number of your sins and the depth of your rebellions. You oppress good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. So those who are smart keep their mouths shut, for it is an evil time. Do what is good and run from evil so that you may live. Then the Lord God of heaven's armies will be your helper, just as you have claimed. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet the Lord God of heaven's armies will have mercy on the remnant of his people. These were God's people. If you remember the story of God's people, the Israelites, they'd suffered as slaves in Egypt for centuries before God rescued them, freed them from oppression. And now they were using their freedom, their privilege, their prosperity to oppress others. We mentioned last week that the people of Israel longed for this day that had been promised, this coming day of the Lord, a coming day when God said he would bring justice to the earth. He would make all things right. All wrongs would be righted. And they longed to see their enemies held accountable and to pay for the things that they had done. But he continues on in, in Amos 5. He says this to them. What sorrow awaits you who say, if only the day of the Lord were here. You have no idea what you are wishing for. That day will bring darkness, not light. In that day you will be like a man who runs from a lion only to meet a bear. Escaping from the bear, he leans his hand against a wall in his house and he's bitten by a snake. <laughs> Yes, the day of the Lord will be dark and hopeless without a ray of joy or hope. It's a pretty grim description, isn't it, of what the day of the Lord will be like. Amos asks them, why would you be excited for God's justice? Why would you think that people getting what they deserve is something for you to look forward to? It's easy to look at your enemies, at the people who have wronged you in your life and to hope that they get justice, to hope that one day they have to pay for what they've done. But what happens when the microscope's turned the other way, when your own life is on display? Suddenly justice might not seem as exciting anymore. But still the people of Israel may have been confused. They may not have been perfect. But like I said, many of them were probably just trying to do the best that they could for them and their loved ones in the society that they lived. Not asking too many questions about where all the peace and prosperity is coming from. Just kind of, you know, even at work, business is business. That's just how people operate. And at the same time, they would have thought that God is actually quite pleased with them because religiously, they were still doing a lot of religious things. They were still a very religious nation. They did everything that they were supposed to do to keep God happy. They observed religious festivals and gatherings. They made religious offerings and sacrifices. Many of them tithed from their income. They gave what they were supposed to do um, to the priests and to the um, temple. They were upholding their end of the covenant. Verse 21, I believe, Amos gets to the crux of what God is saying to his people some of my favorite verses from the whole Old Testament, as God tells them exactly what he thinks of their religion. Verse 21, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. 
I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. The people of Israel were ticking all the right boxes. The priests were up there at the altar making sacrifices. People were visiting the temple, bringing their gifts, being part of all the right festivities and gatherings and singing songs to God. And then they were going home to their mansions and their vineyards with no regard for the poor in their communities or the foreigners or the ill or of living up to the moral standards that God had asked of them. They claimed to follow God, but following means actually kind of being like him. It means following in his footsteps, doing what he does, caring about what he cares about, not just going through the motions of religious duty, but letting your heart and your mind be more and more in line with God's. I don't think anyone else puts it better than another prophet who is Amos's contemporary. No offense to Amos. He does a great job. His is more succinct. But another man living at the same time, so one of these also latter prophets in the 8th century, a man named Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 to 20. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. I asked that question at the start of the message. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does God want from his followers? The people of Israel thought that what God wanted was a bunch of religious activity, that to worship him meant gathering together in assemblies, singing songs, bringing offerings. He says not only does he not want that, he hates that if that is all that it is. It, 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 it what, is, what does he say? Um, it burdens him and he's weary of bearing it. Instead, he tells them what it is that he wants from them. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. And it's not just a theme in the Old Testament. It's not just a theme here for the latter prophets during these sort of section of scripture. That idea of those prophets, the idea of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, that's common throughout the Bible and, and throughout Jesus' life too, isn't it? They called Jesus the friend of the outcast. And yet the people who hated him, the people who wanted him killed, were the ones in power, the comfortable, the religious leaders. This is his words to the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 23. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest amount uh, from your income, from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things, 
For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. There's a danger, isn't there, when people look good and godly on the outside, but are corrupt on the inside. The damage that's done in our world and in our country is immeasurable, isn't it? Many people in both the Old Testament and in Jesus' day thought that they were part of God's kingdom. If you asked them the question, you wouldn't ask them, what does it mean to be a Christian? Because they were living before that word. But if you ask them, what does it mean to be a person in God's kingdom? How do you know if you are a follower of God? They might have said things like, you go to assemblies, you, you pray to God, you offer offerings and you burn incense and you sing songs. They thought that That religious activity was what made them a follower of God. But all throughout the Bible, God says to them, no, that's not it. One analogy that sort of stuck with me um, is the idea of a marriage relationship, although it would work just as well if it was friends or siblings or a parent-child. But just using a marriage relationship for now, in the context of a healthy marriage relationship, if a husband does things like sings songs to his wife and gets her flowers and gifts or writes her poetry or something like that, in the context of a healthy relationship, those are beautiful things, aren't they? But in a dysfunctional relationship, in a marriage that was completely shattered and broken, if a husband is doing things like that just to get her off his back or just to... Um, you know, make up and make amends for how poorly he's treated her through the week. You know, he's sort of like coming, oh, sorry, here's some flowers. <laughs> Suddenly those songs and those flowers and those poems, not only do they lose all meaning, but they'd actually become offensive, wouldn't they? They'd actually become hurtful. They'd be like, stop singing to me. <laughs> <laughs> Just to keep up the charade of having a relationship, just going through the motions for the sake of it, but the heart's not really in it. We need to ask ourselves, do I have a relationship with God or am I just going through the motions? I think that was Amos's challenge to the people back then. Jesus' challenge to the people in his time. I think it's the challenge for us today as well. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. If we want to be followers of God, it's more than just the things that we say or we sing. We need to have hearts close to his, to care about the things that he cares about. If you're still unsure what it is that God wants us to do, um, another of those 8th century prophets, a man named Micah, has perhaps one of the greatest summaries of all the 8th century prophets. He he tells us plain and clear what it is that God wants from his people. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. In a couple of weeks, um, we're going to look at what social justice means for us today, but how we can be involved in justice in ways that matter, both individually in our own lives and, and collectively as a church. What are some things that we can be doing? If God has a heart for justice and for mercy, what are some practical things that we are doing and that we can be doing? We don't want this to be just something that we talk about or pay lip service to, we want it to become something practical so that we're actually making a difference in the world, don't we? So we're going to share in a couple of weeks about more practical ways to do that.
But to finish today, we've been talking about how God doesn't want our religion and how religious activity isn't really what it's about. He doesn't want us to just go through the motions. You know, giving your wife flowers and songs is a beautiful thing, like I said, in the context of a real relationship. Those things, singing to God, gathering in assemblies, recognizing special days, they're beautiful things in a relationship with God, in the context of a healthy, loving relationship. It's just when those things are empty and meaningless and we're doing them just for the sake of it, that's when it becomes detestable. He wants our hearts. And we've got an opportunity now to respond. So I'm going to ask Lou to come around. Where's Lou? She's up there. Lou and Phil's got some. And Pete's available to help hand out some stuff too if you need maybe pens or something like that. Each person is going to receive a little heart. We're going to move into a bit of a time of communion. Um, but usually during communion, you come down to the tables. Are there tables at the back as well? I think there are, right? Yeah. Um, usually you'd come down and receive something. We're going to do that as usual, but there's also going to be an opportunity for you to bring something. Each person is just going to receive a little slip of paper and there'll be some pens scattered around. You may not get a pen each, but that'll be okay. This is an opportunity for us to do something very simple. We could have just done it mentally in our mind, but sometimes I find that doing something physical and tangible can just, I don't know, bring it home a bit more for us. Very simply, all you need to do if you'd like to do this is just to write your name on that heart. It could be on the front, it could be on the back. And this is just an opportunity to symbolize that we are giving God our heart. We're saying to God, um, just as... Um, a psalmist once prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We don't want to be people who are just going through the motions. We want to be people who are actually giving God our heart, who have a heart like him, a heart for justice and for mercy. This is just an opportunity to say right now for you to say to God, God, I'm giving you my heart. I don't just want this to be an outward thing. I don't want to be that dirty cup on the outside that looks clean, but on the inside is actually dirty. Or that other example that Jesus uses of the beautiful whitewashed tomb, but inside um, is death and decay. I don't, want to, I don't want to just have the appearance of being godly. I actually want to have a godly heart. I actually want to give you my heart, God. So this is an opportunity to do that. Um, so yeah, like I said, if you would like to do that, you can just write your name on it. And when you come and take communion, you can just leave your heart there on the table and collect the bread, collect the cup um, as those symbols of God's sacrifice for us. Um, so, yeah, if the communion stewards would like to find their way to the tables, I think Luke might put on a little bit of reflective music. Take a moment, if you like, to pray. Oh, sorry, Chris is going to play. Sorry, Luke. Sorry. Of course. So Chris is going to play some reflective music. You might like to take a moment in prayer. You don't have to rush up to the front. God is a God of mercy. He is a God of compassion. He's a God of justice. He took our injustices upon himself on his shoulders in, through his sacrifice on the cross. Through his body broken, his blood poured out for us, he bore our injustice and he delivered us with mercy. So this is a moment to give him our heart, to ask for a heart like his and to receive his mercy and compassion in return. Eat the bread, hold on to the cup. Do it in your own time. Thanks. Lord God, we thank you for your word to us. God, that, that message of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable Lord, that's a message that is sometimes difficult for us to hear. Lord, sometimes your word has things in it that can be confronting or challenging. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people with ears to hear and, and hearts and minds that are open to hear what it is that you want to say to us. God, we don't want to be people who are just going through the motions, who are just ticking all the boxes, who um, 
yeah, have a foundation of faith that is just based on rituals or empty actions. Lord, we want to be a people who truly know you, who love you, who are in relationship with you. Lord, would you be our, our guide and our rock and our foundation? Would you be our heart? Lord, for the ways in which we are still growing, Lord, each, each of us, we, we still fall short. We all sin. None of us is perfect. God, we thank you that in those times you offer us mercy. But, Lord, we, we also pray that you would help us to be driven to be more and more like you, to not just be okay with the corruption, to not just be okay with the brokenness, um, to know that you love us unconditionally, but at the same time that you want the best for us. You want the best version of ourselves. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue to grow and to become more and more like you, to have a heart more and more like yours. God, we thank you for the challenge of these Old Testament prophets, for their heart for the poor and the oppressed and the afflicted. God, living in such a, a wonderful and affluent and prosperous place as we do, sometimes it can be easy to just sit comfortably and to kind of tune out the, the voices and the worries and the concerns of what we see happening in other parts of the world, but also things that are happening in our own community as well. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people of justice and mercy, that we would be on the lookout for ways that you're calling us to act, calling us to change. God, we thank you that you're here with us. We pray that you would continue to change our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.